and he called his borehole 10X. And he lined it with steel tube about two feet across so that he could get down it and see what was underneath. And he got down 30, 40, 50 feet, and suddenly he heard the steel tubing above his head creaking as the metal failed to hold the pressure of the mud and the water that was down there. His son was working a, a hand-operated winch to get Dan out of there, and Dan, with that great courage and humor of his, shouted up, Unless you want to be an orphan boy, get me up here quick. <laughs> his son put everything he got into it, and Dan could hear these steel tubes, um, thick steel, creaking and groaning and smashing underneath him. And he said he got up with literally seconds to spare. And when we were with him, he showed us, because he then reopened the shaft, and he showed us these steel tubes that had collapsed under the pressure from the mud and water. And if you can imagine, you know the cartoons that you sometimes get of a very badly buckled wheel so that one side is driven in and the wheel changes into banana shape? Well, that's yeah. what had happened to Dan's steel tubes. And if he'd been inside them, he, he laughed and said, man, I'd have been like corned beef inside there. Um, and the other thing that he did with this very deep shaft was to lower a uh, television camera, remote-controlled television camera down the shaft. And we sat beside him watching with tremendous interest as the camera revealed the uh, flooded labyrinth. You couldn't see very far because the water was dark. But it looked as if there were square-cut doorways which were totally artificial. And it seemed, from what Dan's camera was um, recording down there, that somebody, centuries ago maybe, had dug a kind of labyrinth so there wasn't just that one treasure shaft with heaven alone knows what at the bottom, but there was this elaborate um, structure, this system of, of tunnels. And of course, even to this day, and even with all the money that's been invested and with the most modern technology, nobody has beaten that amazing system that, well, it could go back a thousand years. Nobody knows how old it is. One of the theories that appeals to us, um, and there are many possibilities, is that when Philippe Le Bel, the King of France, uh, Philip IV as he was, um, attacked the Templars in 1307, it was suggested that the Templar fleet, which lay at La Rochelle, the French port, had escaped from Philip's soldiers and had gone first to the north of Scotland, where they had been befriended by the Sinclair family, and that they had gone with the Sinclairs, who were great seafaring people, long before Columbus, and had made their way, following the old Viking sea route, past Iceland and Greenland and down the Canadian coast, heading south towards what is now America, and that they had stopped off at Oak Island, and the Templars, who, if we study their fortresses out in the Middle East, like the Clac de Chevalier, which is an architectural masterpiece of military engineering, were they as good at architecture and at digging and constructing fascinating things as they were as warriors? So the possibility is that it was a party of Templars, craftsmen, and architects who dug that shaft and protected something of immense value so that their terrible enemy, Philip Labelle, could never cross the Atlantic to get what he had perhaps attacked them for originally in 1307. And the, the local uh, indigenous uh, Canadians from around there, um, the, uh, the people known as the Micmac Nation, 
they have a wonderful story in their oral tradition about a great hero who came to them over the sea. They describe him in their legend of him as coming across the sea in a canoe as big as an island. Now, that does rather sound as if a Templar ship got to Nova Scotia, and they were very friendly people. And perhaps with the help of some of the indigenous Canadians at that time, they dug the shaft. So the Oak Island mystery, and uh, I'm so glad that you asked about it, Steve, because it's one of the most exciting treasure mysteries in the world. And if anybody is going to find the truth, it'll be our friend Dan Blankenship, because that man is all courage and determination, and he's not going to let a little thing like being 80 years old stop him. <laughs> so when it, when we bring the Templars into the equation, this really widens the perspective for what this treasure might be, does it not? Oh, yes, because when we look back to the origins of the Templars, and how they were situated uh, in what was then part of the great King Solomon's um, stables, uh, which the King of Jerusalem had allocated to them. Uh, They were there in the Dome of the Rock. There are so many accounts of how they dug and explored down there, and it starts to raise pictures in your mind of What was it they were looking for? Could it have been the Holy Grail? Could it have been the Ark of the Covenant? Or was it the the Lance of Longinus, you know, the the great um, psychological weapon, the mysterious weapon, the spear? It was said that whoever held that spear could not be defeated in war. We we look back at these semi-mythical, semi-historical artifacts which must have meant far more in the 12th and 13th centuries to people who hadn't got the benefit of our scientific approach to life and who knew how to ask the right questions and the difficult questions. But was it something like that? Was it some very mysterious artifact, something that had an intrinsic value? And again, the, the, the Templars, when we shift across to another of our investigations at Oren-le-Chateau, which is, of course, the, the theme of, uh, you know, of, of the famous Da Vinci Code book of Dan Brown's. Um, we investigated Ren in 1975, and again, I wanted the information for my students for the uh, mysteries course, and we were very impressed with what was there, because it certainly seemed as if whatever uh, the Templars in the south of France had done, they had not fallen prey to King Philip's men in the same way that the Templar fleet had escaped. One of the great theories there is that something of immense value and tremendous age has hidden somewhere under one of the churches in the little village of Rennes-le-Chateau. Um, and we tie those two in together, and we think, well, what did the Templars have hold of? Well, we know that the Templars around Carcassonne, down there in southwestern France, and the Templars who were stationed near Rennes-le-Chateau, where the Saunier mystery is centered, they knew the Cathars. Now, the Cathars were a very strange and mysterious sect, Um, The Orthodox Church called them heretics, but the the local people whom they helped and healed and fed and were generally very kind and good to the the locals who were in trouble referred to them as les bonhommes, the good men, the kind men, the, the men of God. So whatever their differences may have been with Orthodox religion, the Cathars were certainly good people, just as the Templars were. But the Cathars also had access to very strange mysteries, and it seems possible that they passed those mysteries on to the Templars. See, in 1244, the last of the Cathar fortresses 
which was on a hill called Mont Sigur, meaning the secure mountain, Mont Sigur, fell to the forces of orthodoxy. And the Cathars, who were holding out, were given very interesting peace terms. They were told that if they let the besieging army in, they would be allowed to go, nobody would be killed, but they must touch nothing, and they must take nothing with them. They just had to open the gates and file out and leave their fortress open to be ransacked and searched by the forces of orthodox religion. Now, despite those very generous peace terms, the Cathars decided they would rather die than surrender, because that was the alternative. They were told that if they didn't surrender on those terms, then they would all be massacred. Women, children, everyone. Four Cathar mountaineers left the fortress under cover of darkness and escaped carrying something which they described as only the treasures of our faith. And everyone in that fortress at Montsegur, when it fell, was massacred. And the, the women, the children, the last of the defenders were burnt alive in a terrible mass burning in 1244. And the monument to them still stands today, the, the innocent Cathars who were executed because they would not surrender whatever it was that those mountaineers escaped with. What on earth could it have been that meant more than the lives of the entire garrison and those men escaped with it? What was it? Where did they hide it? Well, I guess that's one of the unsolved, unrecovered treasure mysteries. But the Templars may have known what it was, and it's even possible that the Templars took it from wherever the Cathars had hidden it and buried it somewhere in the village of Rennes-le-Chateau. Oh, what a great story. We're here with Lionel Fanthorpe, and we're uh, we're discussing, well, I hate to say one of your books, because a lot of this stuff covers so many of your books. Uh, yes, it does. And you've even, done, uh, you've even done studies into, like, near-death experiences, have you not? Oh, yes, I have. One of the most amazing of these, which I, I've got to share with you um, and our listeners, concerns... Uh, a man who is now a very great personal friend of ours, David Everson. And about ten years ago, I was making a television series uh, which was being shown regularly here on um, our television channel 4, which was one of our big nationwide independent channels. And uh, the, the story was called, or the series was called Fortean TV, named after Charles Fort, you know, the great American researcher, um, who found so many things and uh, wrote about them back in the 20s and 30s. Now, uh, when we were doing this series, we would deal with a different mystery uh, in each program, and we did a whole show on these near-death experiences. And we discovered that uh, one of the most interesting of these, and a, a man who was able to speak about it with great fluency as well as great feeling, was this gentleman, David Everson. Now, what had happened to David uh, was that as a young man in his early 20s, he had been diagnosed uh, with a form of lymphoma, a lymphatic cancer, and had been given, despite everything that uh, the hospital could do, the thing spread, and Dave was just given a matter of days to live. He was in an isolated one-person ward because he was so desperately ill. And as he lay there, too weak to get out of bed, he had a, a vision. And the way he described it to us was rather like those traditional going down the dark tunnel experience with the light at the end, which so many survivors of near-death experiences talk to 